Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is focusing on healthy buildings, healthy bottom line, FM practices that support corporate ESG targets and cost savings. We have got a fantastic panel and conversation planned for you today. Uh, before we get started, I do ask that you please let us know where you're joining us from. I am Kim Coffey. I'm with IFMA, and I'm joining you from Houston, Texas. Um, and joining me today as our moderator is Lori Gilmer. Um, so as she comes in, I'm going to be turning everything over to Lori. Uh, I will say, Lori, that if uh, everybody's enjoying today's webinar, that they should like this page so that others can join and find this great content. So Lori, it's great to see you again, and I'm going to turn things over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. It is a pleasure to be here today. We've got a great subject as Kim introduced, and I'm going to give you just a few bullet points that we'll go over. Um, one, one thing is, as we think about as we think about healthy buildings and, and a healthy bottom line, we think about ESG and how that's become part of the, the language of business. And as we think about data and, and a way of demonstrating long-term value, what does that really mean? And what are the challenges that we encounter? We'll also talk about the role that facility managers play in demonstrating value. That's one of the key things that we often talk about and educate on. Demonstrating value requires a balance of implementing cost-saving practices as well as sustainable and people-focused initiatives. So kind of that, there's the, uh, the, the academic side and then the social side that we're constantly working to balance. We also will talk about cost savings and sustainability. They're not mutually exclusive. We'll think about ROI as, as asset optimization and how it can be strategically prioritized uh, for better impacts in, in meeting ESG commitments and facility cost reduction. One of the things that we very often are trying to do is that, that cost management, but we don't wanna lose sight of that bigger picture with the workplace experience. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. We have three panelists today joining us and they are quite distinguished. We have Luana Holland Parish. She is Vice President of Standards and Practices for ESFM. She has over 20 years of quality assurance and biopharmaceutical experience. She leads the development and execution of ESM's QA program, drive standards, consistency, and compliance across ESFM. She is also, uh, she's also the current good management practice or CGMP subject matter expert for ESFM and assists clients with their contamination control strategic planning. And finally, she is a US Army veteran, pretty awesome. Next, we have John Ramston. He is the Vice President of Technical Services and Energy Solutions at ESFM. He has nearly 30 years of experience in integrated facility management leadership across several types of clients with a great depth of experience in engineering, technical services, and maintenance strategy. So a lot of really good just linkages uh, that we see across the FM community. He leads technical services and energy solutions for ESFM, where he built a team of technical experts and engineers to lead their self-performed energy solutions program. He holds certifications in aviation and aerospace science maintenance technology and like Luana is also a veteran. He is a veteran of the U.S. Nu nuclear Naval Submarine Force as a nuclear engineering technician. And then finally, we have Dr. Whitney Austin Gray. She is Senior Vice President of Research at, at IWI or Work Well Buildings Institute. One of, she's one of the leading global voices for improving our buildings and communities in ways that help people thrive. She supports best practices in building design and operations, community development, and organizational policies that contribute to improved public health for everyone everywhere. She's done quite a lot of work with, uh, with building uh, with building efficacy, she's she's done uh, led the development of the first case studies that focuses on yeah, that focus on the efficacy of the well building standard, and she helped launch more than a hundred educational sessions that were related to well in over twenty five countries. So quite the span she has. Her lectures, webcasts, and her trainings and published works have touched tens of thousands of people across the design and and uh, professional threshold, all worldwide. So with that, I am going to introduce our first icebreaker. Well, Kim actually technically gave you your first icebreaker in writing your, where, where you're from. Um, I'm normally from California, but today I'm from Alexandria in Virginia. So I'm on the other side of the US. 
Um, so if you could humor me with yet another icebreaker, we're going with what is something that you've done to contribute to your health this week? And it could be anything you want. Now, panelists, I'm going to ask you to say something that you've done. So put you on the spot just a little bit. And I'm going to talk for a second to give you time to queue up your ideas and your thoughts. And everyone else who's listening, if you could text in, let us know what, what have you done that's helped to contribute to your health. And it could be anything from I drank a really great glass of red wine and that's heart healthy too. I went on a walk. I went out and did a hike. Um, anything, anything you want, anything you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. All right. I'll Luana. Yeah, I'll get started. Yeah. I've been on the baseball field a lot with my son. So I've been purposely carrying his items so I can get a little stronger, doing a little bodybuilding exercise while I'm getting him off to the a baseball field. So that's what I've been doing. Awesome. How about you, Dr. Whitney? Oh, I will build on that. So my answer is tennis and as a result, laughter, because although I've been playing since I was It. And this was followed by my toddler saying to me, you just need to go to the doctor and take a new one after. So although it was slightly painful, I will say the laughter helped a lot. And the tennis overall is good for the courts. So all <laughs> very cool. John, how about you? Well, being in facilities for as long as I have, um, it is a very stressful business. And that's why I took the position I did was to give back. But one of the things that's helped me get through it is I constantly work out every day. I've got to do something. That's what tries to neutralize the craziness of all the facilities. So we feel for all of you out there. I think exercise is a good remedy. Awesome. I'm seeing a number of people chat in fun things too. I heard, I saw a plant-based diet. Um, steps. I saw walking, a couple of medical examinations, so lots of lots of good things that we're doing for ourselves. Very good. Well, I'm going to get us started with uh, with our first our first topic. And John, you're up for the, the first question I'm directing to you. So as we think about prioritizing health and well-being, it's become a major emphasis for many companies in conjunction with sustainable building practices. And we can't forget about the impacts of economics and particularly uh, inflation. These are big things that are that are really impacting us right now, especially. So as we think about this notion that healthy and sustainable can mean expensive, what actions can be taken now to increase to create immediate cost savings without losing sight of a company's e ESG commitments? Kind of that balance of ESG costs. You know, where do where do I go? Sure, great question. And again, all of my responses will be uh, respectfully uh, announced. I, I always encourage folks to start with your asset optimization program. Um, know your site. What are you maintaining? What are you PMing and why? Ask the question why. Um, I used to work for a company, IBM, and they had something all over the hallways that said, ask why. And I always remember that. Just ask, why am I doing something? Um, I, I think if you peel back the onion, you'll be able to see the forest through the trees, so to speak. There's what we call a, low, a lot of low hanging fruit opportunities out there. I would look at your asset optimization, your maintenance strategies. Are you PMing the correct things? Are you doing it by risk? Are you uh, performing it by criticality? Look for air leaks. Uh, get your hands on an ultrasonic air testing kit. Look for air leaks. We all know that most plants that are still running on pneumatics, your compressors are probably running more than they should. Um, that's probably maybe because you have air leaks. Are you cycling your compressors correctly? Um, you could look at steam, reuse some of your steam waste for reheat um, if, if that's an option for you. Um, asset optimization is probably the key because once you break down your asset optimization and your assets that you're maintaining, then you can really start to understand what you should be maintaining. And obviously, it's got to be linked to your scope of work and contract with the client. But then you take a look at your labor. Do you have the right labor set? Um, I, I think it's fair to say everybody in facilities uh, is used to contracts being changed out every three or five years. And it's just kind of a, a snowball effect. And we, we've all lived in where we come in and we take over a facility from another um, competitor. 
you got to try and find the time to understand where where the skeletons are, so to speak. Open the doors, kick the rocks over, understand what you're responsible for and do a baseline and do a reset. And then you can look at your labor and there may be cost savings for your labor. You may not be staffed correctly. You may have too many low engineers, not enough higher, vice versa. So that would be my um, my my out of the gate response to low hanging fruit, low cost. Um, and, and typically with some big savings back, especially if you start cycling the air compressors less, those are those are pretty big uh, energy draws. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, Whitney, if you'd like to jump on in on that one, too. Yes. Can you hear me OK? We can. Oh, perfect. And I would actually love if you don't mind, Lori, just to re reframe that, too, and build off of, of John's comments there. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and, and restate the question. And it's this idea that healthy and sustainability means expensive. Sometimes we we jump to, into that and we think, oh, my goodness, I, I can't take that on because that's just going to introduce cost. But what actions, if we kind of turn that around um, and, and don't necessarily subscribe to that to that notion and think about things that we could do immediately, cost savings that we can implement now that won't compromise or, or cause us to um, walk away from our ESG commitments. What kinds of things can we be doing now? Yeah, I love that. And I appreciate you building on that point. So if you walk away from this presentation amongst many of the incredible conversations we're going to be having, I hope we never say energy or health again. So let us clearly understand that when we are improving air quality in buildings, that does not necessarily have an equal sign around energy use. In fact, we can be smarter when we better triage, to John's point, what we need in the building, when the occupants are going to be in the building, what spaces they're using. And I'd like to encourage all the engineers, um, there is a formula that we have that says people will go into a building nine to five, Monday to Friday, but they're not going to perform in the way that they used to. So now we're not necessarily coming in five days a week and we're not all coming in nine to five and we're not all 45 year old males. We have different needs. We come in at different times. We have different thermal comfort points. This is a huge issue for us with the International Well Building Institute is this idea that 68 to 72 degrees is thermal comfort for all. When in reality, women versus men are allowed to wear different clothing. And the original studies that were done on thermal comfort actually come out of the Nordics and they looked at engineering students who were free as participants in their studies to understand thermal comfort rates. And what we really found out is that when we base a lot of thermal comfort on what that specific need is from a male wearing a three piece suit, it's very different than what a woman needs or different times of life or different seasons. And so what I'm trying to point out here is that your formula is Monday to Friday, nine to five, with one type of person coming into your office, that formula is going to change. Furthermore, let's readjust the formula. That doesn't mean when you have better air, that means that you have more energy. These formulas are up for us to reconsider because the variables are changing. And we actually have smarter and better strategies and we don't just try to one size fits all for everyone all the time. Now that may mean and recalculating. But what we have seen by working with Pacific North Lab uh, Northwest Laboratories and others is that when you actually look at energy savings and productivity gains, is that you're going to be ahead of the game. But you do need to sit down with those formulas. You do need to triage to what John is saying ahead of time. And don't be scared. And please don't say or moving forward. Because I have countless examples of actually not giving up on energy targets and promoting human health. If we're smarter, about how we ventilate. We're smarter about lighting strategies for all. We're smarter about when people use the building and what their needs are. So I think it's a really powerful conversation. And like I said, I really hope that we can harness that we are no longer in or, we are in a health and energy conversation moving forward. Excellent, very good. I've got a couple of questions that have come in from, um, from our audience. Before I go to those questions, I've got one for Luana. Um, in thinking about evaluation of systems and SOPs and how they support FMs in reaching a company's ESG targets, um, how how do they how does the evaluation of these things um, help with our our health and well being? 
How do those things relate? Great question. So I'd say as a standards and practices person, right, it's all about est establishing your standards, operating procedures for everything you do. Uh, this immediately drives efficiency in labor and supplies and energy, uh, as John mentioned earlier, but it also enables an organization to identify when and what data they may need to collect. Uh, ESFM has a data-driven cleaning, uh, for example, where people counting and we're looking at it from that perspective and looking at ways to optimize cleaning schedules and labor. Uh, we have a proprietary janitorial program and it's SIMS GB certified. That's good building. And that means that we're looking at not just labor, but how do we incorporate green seal certified cleaning products. We're in this, uh, you know, a post COVID where we're looking at, it has to be clean, it has to be sanitized, but there's still, a, there's still a way that you have to make sure that those chemicals that you're using are clean, that are not, they're effective with cleaning, but that they're also suitable for the environment and that they're not gonna cause harm and damage uh, to the environment. So we're looking at those uh, types of things where appropriate uh, in our organization. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to pivot over to you. John, I think this one might be for you. Uh, Stephen Crow asks a question about uh, BMS. And, and his question is, do you believe that BMS found in most buildings can be properly maintained by the incumbent technicians? Or do you believe that keeping hands off the controls and engineer design will be more effective? And I'm, I'm going to just stop there. Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm going to say both. Um, obviously, if the on-site technicians are going to manage BMS, which is synonymous for BAS, um, they have to have the training. And whether you're using a Siemens or a Johnson Controls um, or a Schneider Electric, they have to have the training. Personally, I prefer our site technicians having the required access because it does two things. It speeds up the recovery time if there's a problem because they're educated and trained on how to fix it and calibrate it and and, and look at the, the holistic what's going on in the building. And it also saves revenue for, and, and money for the company and the third party facilities management provider of having to call in the um, OEM of that product. So I'm a proponent of self-performing whenever we can self-perform and the budget allows it and the training is there. Um, that's a green light for me. There, there are times where I think everybody in our facilities uh, experience has been on a site and um, that a BMS is one of a few critical uh, platforms that a client is usually reluctant to release ownership and responsibility to the third party FM company. Uh, just because of it, it can be very detrimental and dangerous to your business if you don't have the qualified folks doing it. It all comes down to relationships. It comes down to selling uh, why we should self-perform it. But I'm a proponent of self-performing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Whitney, did you want to weigh in on that one? Uh, so I just I think on a broader concept that. I would just say that I think it's powerful that we're training, educating, and translating data that's empowering for users. So the International Wellbuilding Institute released our well performance rating. So where we're taking BMS into a new space of being able to actually communicate to occupants and have them feel empowered is something we take very seriously. So um, data is not information without a translator and not all data everyone needs to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're really honest, most of the time, and particularly before the pandemic, many people just wanted to know that the space was doing well and was safe. And they really only want to know when there's a problem. And so as research scientists, people will often say to me, if we had just had the data, then people would be so happy, you know, if they just had more data about a healthy building. No, those people have full-time jobs which are not monitoring the air quality in their space. They want to feel safe and they need you to communicate that they have safe and good, for example, air quality during this time. So I think I just wanna put out there that we're seeing and you know, Jason uh, Johnson Controls, we work very closely with them on Honeywell and Carrier and many others as part of the well performance rating. And I think there's this really exciting conversation of what's possible 
And let's make sure that we, we keep on what's possible, the information we can share with users and who has control over the BMS, while also making sure that we as professionals are the translators of that data into information. We don't get ahead of ourselves and give people too much information before they're ready to see it. And most importantly, information that people can't act on. Because mm -hmm. now that's not information, that's a problem. And so I do believe that our building professionals on the line today have the authority because they actually are going to be a trusted advisor of the building to say, my, my space is safe. Tell me if it's not, right? And you need to be communicating the invisible because many people cannot see the air quality, but don't over communicate and let's not overly rely on what's possible of data. And let's be thoughtful about what we need to communicate for people to feel safe and healthy in their spaces. Right. And I, I think what you're talking about is that that higher level communication as well, understanding what's really important to the, to the people in the building, what's important to the organization, and how am I using things like the information from a BAS to help communicate messages like the space I'm in is, is healthy, safe, et cetera, but even defining what that really what that really means and being the interpreter of that data. All right. Very good point. Um, and in, in on the subject, kind of moving on with, uh, there was a study from IWI that was recently issued. It was a, a research and review about how health investments can not only enhance business performance, uh, which the ESG reporting should show, but it can also offer better financial returns. So Whitney, can you explain some of the highlights of your findings that would bring value to today's audience? Sure. So um, this is a resource for everyone. We'll share it with you in the links. Um, but as part of investing in health pays back, what we need to demonstrate is that your investment in a healthy place pays back for your occupants, health and well-being, which is not just disease avoidance, it's health promotion. So we're going to reduce everything from allergies and asthma, and we're going to promote productivity, engagement, thriving, wanting to return to the office. So when it comes to a company's balance sheet, the majority of the cost of running a company is going to be the people. So if you can make an argument that you improve their productivity by 3% or that you decrease their risk of disease by 3%, that alone has a very strong multiple. So the early studies would talk about a 330-300 law that was a JLL early report, or you might have heard something along the lines of over 90% of the cost of operating a building or operating an organization, I should say, is going to be in the people. So at IWBI, we study people. So we're going to give you metrics that demonstrate that when you invest in the environment, right, when you invest in organizational health, that you're going to have the people metrics to pay that back. What's exciting is that we are really pushing the edge to not just say that this is about um, productivity alone, but the new, we're, we're being faced with challenges entering into what I would consider as the new era of work. I Many are calling it a hybrid era of work. So don't be mistaken, the last two, three years of the pandemic, those were not the new era of work. That was quarantine and isolation. That was a forced experiment on hybrid work. We are now entering into a decision period of if and when I can, would I hybrid work? If and when I can expand my portfolio, will I as corporate real estate? How do I address stranded assets where people are not returning to the office? So we're not just looking at productivity gains, we're talking about retention. We're talking about getting people back to be the most creative, engaged um, possible for companies. They're seeing brain drains happen. So when companies invest in their people and they can document the places they spend 90% of their time in matter for their health, then we have a strong business case to make for why companies don't just put all their money into a workplace wellness program, which is a meditation app. Let's put more money into the air you breathe. Let's put more money into where you spend the time and the people around you. Um, and I will just add is that places create community and we cannot heal from this pandemic in isolation. We are meant to be in community and take a lot of, um, I think, you know, I take, I take a lot in that we create places for people to heal. I do not say that lightly and that people are, not doing well in isolation. So we need to get people into environments where they can be healthy, thrive. We need organizations to invest in those environments. And we need, I like mindfulness apps, they're great. 
but I need some healthy air, right? And I need the healthy places. And so we've created a business case to make sure that you can make that argument. And I think later in the conversation today, we're also gonna talk about how a business case is gonna help set you up in ESG as well and with corporate social responsibility reporting. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And I'm actually going to take us down a little bit more detailed path. So John Lamana, this one's coming your way. You work with your ESFM clients to turn information into a plan for energy management. So how do you make the data work for you um, so that you can make smart decisions, especially if investments need to be made? So John, I'll start with you and then <clears throat> we'll pivot over. Sure. When, when we go out and we visit a site, it's never the same because one of the first questions we'll ask the site management are, what are your pain points? And typically, if a site has a pain point, there's probably a loss of efficiency and a loss of money there. So each site study will be different, but we can do a bottoms up or a top down study. But yes, data Data should drive the decisions. And if you don't have the data, we have to figure out a way to get the data. And BAS, BMS, utility records, bills, gas, water, electricity, that's a good start. We will take a look at that compared to your baseline. And pre-COVID occupancy is, to Dr. Whitney's point, is completely different of the occupancy now. And we should be looking at the quadrants of the buildings not being used and what can those set points be. That's an immediate utility savings and carbon footprint reduction as well. Um, the data should drive the decisions. Where we're trying to get to in the community is making sure your BAS systems are calibrated. Don't just take it for granted that they are because if, if they're not on a semi-annual or annual PM to where you're proactively making sure your, your um, BAS or BMS is calibrated, they're probably not calibrated. And if they're not calibrated, they're not reporting correctly. If they're not reporting correctly, they're not running to OEM specs. So we like to start there. We have a building automation expert on our team that is familiar with all the platforms that are out there. And that's one of the places we like to start along with pain points. And then we start peeling the onion back and we can find some pretty quick opportunities for quick savings, optimization that will lead sure to capital programming. And I know we'll get to that in a little bit, but if you if you have the data, it can it can substantiate the um, sell, if you will, to the C levels, why they need to put the money into their capital plan. Um, that they're going to make decisions off of data. They are not going to make decisions off of emotion. They're not going to make decisions off of, well, we dropped the building three times at the same time of year for the last three years. They're not going to make decisions like that. They're not the ones that are responding on when you're on PTO or a holiday weekend, because that's when building outages happen. They're going to make decisions on data. Where we're trying to get to, and we're working on a product in the background, is taking the BAS data and what are you doing with it? To, to Dr. Whitney's point, now you have the data. Now you have an opportunity. What are you doing with that data? And we're working with some partners to crunch that data and see where the opportunities are. And it's pretty significant low hanging fruit that can work anywhere from $100,000 uh, uh, for a capital project up to multi-million dollars. But if we're going to get to our sustainability goals together in this country, we have to have good data. And, and that's the challenge where a lot of these older facilities, uh, what's on your BAS system? Maybe 100%, maybe 50%. We find anywhere in the middle. But you have to get your critical pieces of equipment on BAS so you can track your data and then do something with the information on the background. From there, we'll put a report together and deliver it, deliver it to our operators and our clients, and we'll recommend by risk, by priority, what is important to that site. To my earlier comment, not all of our visits are the same. Very, very few are the same, uh, mm -hmm. if any. Uh, they're all different depending on the facility um, cosmetics, if you will. And we listen to the operators and being an operator, I'll end here and pass it to my colleague, Luana, um, is, is the operator is being listened to more and more now post COVID than they were pre COVID. And it's way overdue. Um, it, it, the folks that are running the facilities know exactly what is going on at the facility level 
and and their voices and their opinions need to be heard more and more and more and then that will push data driven decisions which will result in working towards sustainability goals and actually getting there uh, I agree with that, John. Uh, and then we have to look at technology, right? So the key element here, and I think everybody's touching on that, is what technology is going to do. Um, and we've got to be able to be responsible with that data. Is there process improvement on the other side? We're not just looking at it for the sake of um, what our clients are, but we are very interested in what our frontline associates are seeing and saying about that data. But again, we have to responsibly apply that. Um, ESFM's uh, Senior Vice President of Technology, his name is Chris Lilly, and uh, we're happy to announce that he will be speaking um, with, with IFMA's uh, World Workplace with Nuvolo about our company's, uh, you know, proprietary, um, we would say, you know, um, our proprietary company's um, exclusive uh, platform that will allow us to look at that in several different ways. We want to make sure, again, that we're responsible about the data, but it's not just a plug and play. A lot of this stuff is really specific to the client and how the client would like to run the facility. Us being in a position where we have um, a great team and we have technology um, at our disposal, it means that we have to be able to work closely with our clients to make sure that the output makes sense and that at the end of the day, uh, like many of you were saying around process and improvement, uh, that we have to make sure that the people that occupy these buildings feel safe and that that data does something. Uh, when you're walking in a building, for instance, it, nothing's going to say it's a safe place. Uh, are we using something as, uh, you know, color coding to say, oh, green, meaning that uh, the space I'm about to occupy has been cleaned in the last 20 minutes or that the space that I'm about to occupy will not be available or there has to be a certain amount of time to allow air exchanges or what have you. But this all goes into how we educate our people and how we educate the folks that are in the building so they feel safe. So I think that there is um, uh, much of what we're all saying, but there is a great uh, balance to this where we're applying what makes sense, but making people feel safe, not only just to occupy the spaces, but they, they're gonna be safe when they leave and that whatever they're uh, doing in that building is not something that they will inherit and take to the, their loved ones. So I think we are responsible for a really big dynamic here. But again, I think uh, the key dynamic is moving forward with technology and what that and what that will look like in, in the future. Yeah. And, and, and if I may just say one more thing, yeah, Lawana um, recognize our senior VP, Chris Lilly. And one of the cool things he always says, and, and, and it comes from our top leadership, it's made for the operator. Everything we do is have to have the operator in mind to make their day and their life better. The caveat here with ESFM, Luan and myself, our colleagues, we act as consultants to them, our internal clients. They are our clients. We're there to help them. They have day jobs. They cannot figure all this out by themselves. So that's what our teams are put together for, is to go out and help them be successful. Very good. Thank you very much. Excellent points. And Luana, I particularly like what you said about um, ensuring safety of people in the building. That is that kind of highest calling. If we think about what is the facility manager, what is, what is the charge of those who work in the buildings? It's always ensuring safety. Um, some of these other things are, are secondary, extremely important, yes but safety is, is our number one, uh, our number one thing. I'm going to ask a question. This came in from Catherine Cap Canapelli and Catherine asks, healthy buildings are also human centric, AKA occupant oriented. How can FMs get more real time feedback on occupant experience that will help decarbonize buildings without adding burden to their workday? Are apps the answers? Is there a simple way to, to measure uh, measure, monitor, and control energy where people use it. Sounds like she has an answer, but she's looking for some input <laughs> from this panel here. Um, so, what, so what do we think? Um, how are which way are things going to go? Is there is there an, an easy way uh, for FMs to get that real time feedback? I know there's a lot that's going on with technology, and things seem to always be improving at quite the pace, especially with our, our higher, more integrated um, tech. So, um, so to the panel. 
Um, I'm not sure who wants to start that first. John, I'm thinking you, but um, I could easily go with Luana or Dr. Whitney. Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, I, I, I think, well, I, I mentioned it prior. It, it is about the data, the accuracy of the data, and what we are doing with it. And, and I want to go back to something that Dr. Whitney was talking about. Mm -hmm. When we were getting ready to go back to work and coming out of hibernation um, that we were all forced into, so to speak, um, we put together a back to work SOP with a checklist. And one of those checklists had on there an item that, you know, you, you can walk in and you can see the stocks and the markets and what's going on and what's for lunch and breakfast. Why not display from the BAS system what your carbon monoxide, your carbon dioxide, your oxygen content is? Visual aids are very important to give folks a comfort level to come back to work and say, oh, OK, now I can at least see what the air quality is and we educate them on that, that that's coming right from your BAS system. Fast forward. It's really about taking the data out of the BAS system, making your BAS system, BMS system synonymous, as robust as possible. And there's a there's a back end product that we're working on that is real time data that it, it's not ready for launch or release yet, but it's coming um, within the next month. And we're working together with that with Chris Lilly to launch that. It's to make the building more autonomously operated with the operator in the middle of it and get them instantaneous alerts as to what's going on with their building. They can't cover 500,000 square feet, 2 million square feet at a time. But if your BAS is tied into this system, we can immediately ping your phone and tell you that a chiller tripped offline or your HEPA filter got clogged because the highway dirt was coming in. Whatever that case is, we can get instantaneous data to the field technicians at the site to help them proactively get out there quicker than wait for a failure in equipment or indoor air quality issues, so to speak. So it is about the data and it is about turning around an action item as a service and a solutionable uh, point of contact quickly. Um, that, that program is being worked on by a lot of folks out there. Um, there's some great products out there, but we think where we're heading is, um, is better. So thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks for jumping in on that one, John. Luana, did you wanna to add to that? I can pivot yeah. that Sure. Sure. I, I would think another thing to add is like on demand cleaning instead of using your resources and everyone in the building, like who's occupying what space and where and when should we deploy the appropriate people to clean it and what how and what we're cleaning it with. So I think when you put all that together with John, John just said and we talk about on demand versus, uh, you know, versus just cleaning a bathroom four times a day. Maybe you're only cleaning that one time a day and you're spending your energy in your real time where people are migrating uh, that particular day. So it just tells us a whole host of um, data and provides us with how and what to do uh, with our people that are there uh, to keep a, keep the place clean. So I can add a little bit. Uh, so on a broader note, I would, um, so first off, Catherine, I love a question where you already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have to type in the chat what your answer is. So want to hear from you. Um, I would turn you to a client we work with at the International Well Building Institute was one of the first well-certified projects, which is um, EDGE. And they worked very closely to the Olympic building. And this is out of Amsterdam. It's a really interesting example of a highly high-tech space where they're using occupant feedback to run the building. And what I would encourage you in looking at that case study to examine is that right now we are still experimental. So you need to think through a couple of things. So not all data is information about a translator. So who is your translator? So an app is not always an answer when there's a problem because you need a translator to see the problem and translate that there's already a solution. Uh, we don't want that raw data to be interpreted in the wrong way. Second thing about human behavior is that if you create a system that's only about reporting problems, then don't be surprised when all you get is problems. When you incentivize people through human behavior to report on what they want, they're more than likely to share their information with you and you're actually promoting good use of the data. So let me give you some examples of that. Um, so, well, from a privacy perspective, I'll give you this one, is that people are very nervous. Oh, I'm going to be tracked everywhere, right? You're always gonna know where my movement is. That was a serious fear on every webcast I was on, right? <laughs> like a decade ago. 
Well, you know, guess what? You already gave all your data over with an iPhone because you got the benefit that the iPhone brought you. And many people don't even realize with their Bluetooth being on is that many beacon technologies and others can pick up your location in space. So you gave that information because you were getting something as a result. And be sure that they are major companies, a lot of consulting companies are working right now to track their people's use in space. What do you get from that? If you use it punitively, be prepared for people to turn the technology off. So if it's used well, people will say, great, you can see where I'm at, you can see what I'm doing, you can see what I need. And if I'm using it to get the benefit of what great free meal I'll get for lunch, or I get to figure out where the best parking spot is, then I will show you where I am in the building and I'll let you know about the thermal comfort and this is a great interaction. If you start using it punitively to say that I'm not where I'm supposed to be, or you're tracking me in the wrong way, be prepared for people to turn off the technology. So RFID is a great example of that. We did that in healthcare situations where we were tracking assets and trying to figure out how to make sure we can manage assets at the location of need for patients. This had to do with patient lifts, for example. And then at one point we decided, oh, we'll give the RFIDs to the nurses. And then they lost a patient. And this is an extreme example, but it's important. The patient was lost. And so they did an m and so that's a review of why the patient was lost. And they started pointing fingers who was where they were supposed to be at the exact time that they said they were going to be. And now it was no longer about assets. It was no longer about helping. It was no longer about powerfully tracking. It was about disciplinary action at the highest level. All those RFIDs that cost at the time 40, 50 bucks per person were ditched in coffee mugs and plants. The researchers never really got them back. So I said a lot there, but I, what I want you to know about when you start asking about human behavior is number one, don't assume all data is good. Make sure that you have a translator for that data. Two, understand human behavior. If you want data from people, give them a reason to give it to you. And the third thing, don't be punitive in it, right? So if you want problems, you wanna be punitive and where people are tracking them or saying, I'm basically going to be using this data and not a promoting way for the individual, don't be surprised when they sort of turn off or disengage. And on that last note, we'll also point out, we learned this about BMS as well. Don't assume the data you have is interesting for them. Unless people get a benefit from it, they're going to turn it off. So if you develop your brilliant app just for air quality, no one's going to use it unless there's a problem with the air quality and they need to know about it. So be careful what you're asking. Now, if you're giving them free lunch, you're letting them know the location, like Edge did, very cool technology, and said where you can park, and by the way, how's the air quality? Now we've got something going because people are using the app. Cushman Wakefield, another example of launching a workplace wellness app in which you got all this benefit, and then FM also got to know where you are and how comfortable you were and what your needs were. So think about the human behavior element and making sure people get something they want from this technology, You're not just creating it for the sake of creating it. All right, a lot, a lot is packed in those answers. The human element never ceases to, uh, to uh, interest and surprise me. Um, but great points all across. I'm gonna bring us up just a, a little bit um, back to ESG strategies and targets. Mm -hmm. And, and this one is is for everyone. In, in thinking about sometimes communicating um, communicating ESG targets, there's a disconnect between what the facility managers do and, and sometimes what the organization wants. A lot of times what happens is the organization says, this is what you must achieve, or we're going to go in this particular direction. Hey, facilities, go ahead and you know take off, deliver, please. Um, or they'll have some sort of mandate that comes without a lot of context, sometimes without funding and support. And so it's incumbent upon the FM to, to then figure out the plan. So if you think about, um, if you think about kind of that, that context that the FM is often operating in, how would you, uh, how can facility managers build bridges with their senior leaderships to get a seat at that table. We often talk about the table as well, you know, getting to the C-suite table and being influential in decision-making. And particularly when we're talking about these things like ESG that are such big topics right now, 
how does the, what would you suggest, what would your recommendation be to, for the FM who wants to be in that influence position, who has something they must deliver on? Uh, what, what can they do to get that seat at the table? Who would I'll, like to start? I'll, I'll, take, <laughs> I'll take a stab at this. Um, living and being an operator for the better half of my career, at least, it, it, it comes down to relationships. It comes down to trust. Um, hopefully you all have that with your superiors. It, it is a paradigm shift for sure. And I think several of us mentioned it, that the operators are being listened to more and more, but quite frankly, not enough. And we, we have to understand that the, just because there's a senior title above us at, at a, as an operator in the field, that does, does not mean they know more than us. And I think what's happening is a lot of the sustainability goals, a lot of the corporate goals, some are thoughtful, some are not, and they should not be um, one size fits all just because you're all under the same company logo. It should be site specific. You have to know your facility. You have to have the relationship. You have to have the data. Again, data is going to drive decisions. You also need to have the history of the building utility bills, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of smart operators out there. Here's the challenge is they have a day job. Now they're being asked to pull all this together on top of their day job. And their day job is the scope of work, the clients, the KPIs, the deliverables, keep the lights on, make everybody happy. And now it's, I got to educate senior management on why the sustainability goal they rolled out is maybe not feasible. Um, that, that takes a lot of effort, and that's one of the things that I'm most proud about to work with ESFM is we have that team as part of our Centers of Excellence team that reports up into our leadership, and we act as consultants. We go out and we actually help them do that. So in the, in the middle of the battle, running up the hill, running out of ammunition, I would say you're going to need support. You're going to need support. You need to build the bridges, the relationships. You can't, you, the facilities managers always looked at as the jack of all trades. Well, this is a new trade. This is a new trade with a lot of um, uh, political attention. There's a lot of financial attention. And, and quite honestly, in my opinion, uh, if I was in that position, I could not do it alone. I have to have the supporting staff and, and I would look for you to look internally to your company for that supporting staff because you're either going to spin your wheels and you're going to burn out trying to do it by yourself. This is a huge undertaking and there should be, there should be support staff for them there. Yeah. I agree with you, John. Uh, again, you say trust, reliability, uh, and then you also have to have transparency. You have to be transparent. Uh, our facilities manager uh, are no longer, uh, you know, somewhere in a boiler room, they're front and center and they're expected to do things that perhaps they are not, uh, trained to do in such an eloquent manner that you, we expect them to have a lot of conversations and be able to present that data a certain way, but they do have it. So I do say that there has to be some agreement on what that transparency looks like, alignment, and then being able to have those tools and resources available to our operators out there uh, to assist. So I will say a centers of excellence and, and what we do is an amazing thing because we can take that burden off of what our operators are feeling. We can look and see what's happening, uh, more of a global look at what's happening in our respective sector and in our company that can then bring in and filter best practices. So you don't have to run around and recreate the wheel in some of these instances. We can look at some of our facilities that have been successful, that may be uh, dealing with some of the same challenges, but again, trust and transparency and alignment with your client base is important. And I can add a little bit there. So um, ESG, you know, first coined by Gifford, that's 2005. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms. It's called basically alphabet soup. So it is quickly moving. There's new acronyms. There's new players. What you need to know is that essentially is external reporting. You're going to be held accountable to externally report on what's material for your company. Um, whether that's your environmental targets, your social targets, or your governance targets. Will there be more? A health target? Yes, there will be. 
So my advice is get credit where credit is due. So where the well building standard is going to help is we're going to give you that credit. So if you're pursuing the air quality features in well, you will also receive a resource that shows you how to report your UN sustainable design goals and exactly which features in well are going to help you align with that. And you can print out the report and give it to your CEO as you take a seat at the table. We will also print out a report for you that you can look, for example, at GRI. Um, you can understand what we're doing in GRESB. So what you're trying to say is, listen, the thing I'm doing to elevate air quality to, for example, promote, um, uh, for example, productivity for people in the space, to improve uh, breathability, to reduce potential um, pathogens, then we're actually going to track you to that. We're going to link it with you and SDG. Ready for alphabet soup? GRI, GRES, SASB, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to give you the report and you can deliver on that report. So we're furthermore just launched at NASDAQ in 2022, the 12 competencies for measuring health and well-being for human and social capital. Um, longest title ever. Why this is important for you is that you can directly link the feature in well with exactly the ESG rating system, and there's many in the alphabet soup, with ways to track and validate your outcome. I think Boston Properties did a fantastic job in their CSR. Cushman Wakefield, a leading client of ours, did a fantastic job in their corporate social responsibility report of elevating building health in their report. Your goal is to get in the first three pages. Every CEO's letter right now says people matter in their corporate social responsibility report, which is what they're going to use as basically an overview summary, and that also is going to describe their ESG disclosures. Read that. It's free to download for the majority of companies that are public. You can even ask to receive some that are private because they've already um, done those reviews and ask yourself, am I on the first three pages or not? And if they say the word people in that leading letter around materiality, you say, I'm tracking people's health. I'm doing it through well. This is the exact features that I'm pursuing. This is exactly how I can report on the outcome and take a lot of pride in this. So if this feels overwhelming for you, in 2008, CBRE, which is again, a leading client and partner of ours at the International Wellbuilding Institute, if you looked at their corporate social responsibility report and you looked at what they were doing to report the E, it was all words, right? There's a lot of description of some programs that we're doing and they were trying to figure out how do we across the portfolio create greater specificity in reporting and elevate sustainability as a core issue of materiality. Pause. And then flash forward 15 years, 2021, open that CSR report from CBRE. And what did they have under their E? All numbers. Mission targets, for example. So that's what's happening right now with S, right? We are getting higher specificity. We are tracking on how you can get credit where credit is due, and we're pushing companies to disclose materiality. But use and outsource. Make sure that you're using these resources like at um, IWBI, because we're going to help you do the work in the alphabet soup land to get you on those first five pages of your company's CSR and to elevate that healthy buildings are material for companies. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> a lot of information packed into that, that uh, those, those answers. I'm going to add to this a little bit. Um, I think as we think about that um, building bridges in the C-suite, we've talked a lot about different resources and things available. Um, this is a common question in facility management. It's how do I get to be at the C-suite? And we used to kind of whine and whinge a little bit about um, you know, not having influence and not being able to be at the table, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think another resource that we have out there, you, this is you know, if most sponsored, so I'd be remiss if I said nothing here. We have really great educational resources as well for facility managers. And, and what we're aiming to do as a profession is grow our competence. We're growing our relationships and our resources. Um, so so our, our panelists has been, have been speaking about a lot of resources and things that they've done that, that are available. And, and, I, and I thank you for that. We also have education that we, can, um, that we can use to add to that competence so that we can speak knowledgeably about 
what Lawana and John and Dr. Whitney have been speaking about so that we can understand our corporate mission and goals. And we understand how facility management plays a core part of that. So that's, that's another area that I think um, the way you get to the C-suite is by being competent. It's by understanding um, understanding your part, the part that you play, the part that you own, where you have influence and where you have control um, so that you can deliver and represent uh, what, what your company is about. Um, it's tagging into that language of the C-suite. It's understanding what do they care about? Um, step into their shoes. Think about how they think and what they message. Um, sometimes our details are just way too detailed for, for that group. They want something really high level. They want to understand value, health, safety, those kinds of things. They want to be on the first three pages, to Dr. Whitney's point of the, uh, of the report. Um, and I would encourage you to, we talk about how can you get that education. There's, there's literally good education opportunities available through IFMA that, that are more um, kind of your, your road education, the FMP, the SFP, et cetera. We also have wonderful opportunities to learn by doing through joining chapters and councils and communities. Those are great ways to also practice your, your leadership chops. So as you think about that messaging, um, let's, let's not, let's not forget that in the FM community, those are some other really good resources to use. So I'm going to pull us in on, um, we're, we're in the last, this has gone by really, really fast, everyone. This has been a great discussion. Um, we're going to close with, with our final question. And, um, and I'm sorry if some of, if some of you have put in questions that we didn't quite get to, and we may be able to follow up with that at a later point. Um, but to everyone, as we, as we close in, healthy buildings, they are an investment. How do we elevate the business case of investing in our healthy buildings and draw that connection to the healthy bottom line? I know we've kind of been threading through that. This is kind of, think about your last comments to the audience. How does this play a part in getting ahead of reporting regulations in our operations. John, I'll start with you and we'll kind of work our way around. Well, I was hoping I didn't have to go first this time. Um, yeah, that's that's a tough one. Um, it, it, I, I think it goes back to the relationships, the education. And I did, I did want to mention one more thing though on the last topic. Um, I, I, I would think that most of you do what's called communities of practice. Networking is huge, not just the education, but sharing your, your, your brother in or your sister in out there are probably struggling with the same kind of issues. Uh, encourage a, a communities of practice call once a month or every other month for your work stream and share your ideas. Um, and I think you'll be pretty impressed with what you could come up with there for some low hanging fruit and cost savings. Um, I'm Laura, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, honestly, because I'm, sure. I'm kind of tap dancing here. And I, I was hoping Dr. Whitney was going to jump in. I all can, over I can, this I can, well, I let's can, I can it. jump in because there was a lot of really technical FM questions that I yeah, was so, so thankful. Team, John. Yeah. Team me up. Would you please? Do it. 30 seconds or less. We are in our last two minutes and I do want to make sure that I share a final resource. We've got a QR code that's going to pop up on the screen in just a minute. So 30 seconds or less, wrap it up. Uh, so I think. For the business case, I'm going to focus on that building centric metrics are also people centric metrics. The resources that I've listed today are going to be about the business case um, with well certified. Take a look at that. Take a look at our 12 competencies and recognize that we're at the beginning of this journey, but get those numbers down. Just like CBRE, 15 years from now, you will be held accountable for people metrics and you want to make sure you've got a roadmap to success. Under 30 seconds. All right. Well done. Luana, last <laughs> thoughts. I mean, I would say similarly, I think it's a, it's still an ethical push at the end of the day that you're doing things the right way and that you are aligning with your client's needs. Uh, although we have a ton of data and a lot of metrics that we can peel through all the time, uh, we want to make sure that people are comfortable and ethical with the data that is being um, presented and pushed out. Yeah, and I'll just chime real quick, if I may. Um, thank you, ladies, for teeing me up. Um, I am getting ready to go play golf on vacation, so thank you. It's perfect timing. Um, be honest with yourself. Know your facility. Know your baseline. 
Um, it, it is going to be about trust and relationships and reporting. As Dr. Whitney said, whatever you put on paper eventually is going to get out to the newspapers and the public. Be honest with yourself. Know, know your facility and, and be very accurate on your reporting, whether it's popular or not. Don't overstate it. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Uh, you saw just a minute ago a QR code that pops up. This is hot off the press from ESFM. It's a valuable resource that we're sharing with you. It's a report that shows you that includes steps to sustainable cost savings. This is going to be shared in a follow-up email. So if you're not getting to capture this quite yet, don't panic. We will send this out. You can also, if you're really fast with your phone, you can take a screenshot and download that report. So thank you very much, ESM, for, for uh, making that available to this group. We so appreciate that. And panelists, Luana, John, Dr. Whitney, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an excellent webinar and a really, really fast hour. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again. Thanks, all. Thank Be you. Bye-bye. Well.